I'll be talking about my educational journey. Now, I know what you all are thinking. How could a kid my age have an educational journey? I will answer those thoughts and many others by the end of my presentation. Let me start out by introducing myself, as Bruce already did. My name is Michael Tyler Winter, but everyone calls me Mike. I was born and reside in Salisbury, North Carolina. Do I have any fellow Southerners in attendance today? Would you please raise your hands? That's it? <laughs> I guess we're all three in the end or something. <laughs> well, I guess you will be my special helper this morning. I may need your help translating my speech. Now, I've been working really hard on my diction, but some of you might need to turn to your southern neighbors from time to time for help understanding something I've said. But don't worry, I have a crook in my robot to share my same southern accent. <laughs> I'm nine years old and I just completed the fifth grade. I've been a member of Vinsa since the age of four. I am also a Davidson Young Scholar at the Davidson Institute for Talent and Development. My hobbies and interests include computer and robotic programming, swimming, building Legos, lots of Legos, basketball, and IMSA racing just to name a few. My family includes my mom, Melissa, and my dad, Mark. I don't have any brothers or sisters. My dad is a custom home builder, and my mom's full-time job is... me. <laughs> it takes an enormous amount of time to get me to all the places I need to be. I keep a pretty busy schedule. In fact, I finished here today, and I'm scheduled to be at MIT on Monday morning. Wow, I sometimes wonder how my parents do it all. Thank you both for all you do for me. Now, before we begin this journey, I want to make one point out. If you attended Bruce's PowerPointers from a PowerPoint presentation, yes, my slides are a little flashy, but I'm not. I like flashy. Okay, so let's start this journey. You might notice a lot of similarities to your own journey, and you may have encountered some of the same obstacles I have. First, how did my parents know I was gifted? Looking back, they realized at a very early age that I was highly alert and aware of my surroundings. People would come up to them and comment about how well I talk and behave. It was a big deal when I wrote my full name with sidewalk chalk at a summer camp when I was two. My mom and dad did not know it was abnormal for a kid to write their survey. Had to compare to anyone else. I'm an only child, and my cousins are all much older than me. Everyone at the camp was amazed at my ability to read and write. The following year, my parents signed me up for junior kindergarten, and in an attempt to get me to school early, because I had a September birthday, I had to take an entrance assessment. A few days after the assessment, my parents got a call from the psychologist that tested me. She wanted to meet with my parents and discuss my results. My parents said that they were surprised to get the call, but a little nervous about what they might learn. They made the appointment right away and went into her office. It was at this meeting that my parents learned I was profoundly gifted. Two words that would change our lives forever. Needless to say, I didn't go to junior kindergarten that year. The school only wanted to look at my age and not my abilities. They did not make early admission into their program, regardless of my superior assessment. There it is. The first obstacle or roadblock in my journey. Might only have three letters, but this word has caused me more problems than all the others combined. Age. Why does age carry so much power? When it comes to denying gifted the kids access to the resources we so strongly crave, age. We'll see this obstacle reappear many times throughout my journey. My parents realized they need to find
provide credible evidence to help legitimize the claims of my giftedness. One day, while I was being tutored by a local college student, the thought of Mensa popped in their heads. A quick internet search confirmed that I more than met the ten school requirements for membership. Mensa, awesome, I thought. Now people will take me serious when I say I'm a member and believe when my parents tell them I'm trying to get me into different schools or programs ahead of the age requirements. Many people said they had heard of Mensa, but didn't know exactly what it was. They, some people didn't understand the level of intelligence it takes to become a member. I made the front page of our local newspaper with a nice article about my ascendant into Mensa. I was now part of an extended family that could help me break down some of my educational obstacles. I stayed home that year and continued to learn my own with the help of my parents. I built many Lego sets quickly, even those marked for 16 and up. I had the unique ability to see things in any direction and still follow the steps. I would sit in my desk for hours, hyper-focused on a Lego set and driven to complete it. The feeling of accomplishment for each one was fantastic. My insatiable appetite for knowledge was growing and my parents were doing everything they could to feed it. Also, I've always had an affinity toward technology. I could spend hours at the big box electronic stores exploring the features on the computers and iPads. I remember my dad holding me up on his knees so I could use each one. I received my first iPad when I was about 18 months old. I learned so much from it. The apps taught me so many things. US geography, math, and I even used a stylus to help form the shape of each letter. Technology became an open window through which knowledge was beaming in, and I couldn't get enough. I learned everything about that iPad, from Apple's interface to shortcuts to help me navigate more efficiently. But at this point, I still hadn't been exposed to the vast world that is the Internet. As my knowledge grew, so did my interest in learning the how and why of everything. The local public school system only looked at my age. Wait, there is again, age. My parents have found a private school within driving distance of our home that would consider admitting me early into kindergarten. I went through their assessment, and to my parents' surprise, they said, I simply didn't need kindergarten, and I could spend another year being a kid and come back next year and start the first grade. Had I found a school that understood what I was needing? Only time would tell. Okay, so who here in the audience thinks that they understood what I was needing? Raise your hand. Okay, and not? Well, I'll see who wins that book. <laughs> I began first grade. My first foray into a learning world known as school. I spent the first portion of the year learning how to go to school. How the routine worked. Getting used to spending significant time away from my mom. I did excellent in school without having any real problems. I wasn't one to act out in class or to ever have a behavioral problem. I followed my teacher's directions and used my manners. I made friends and was active in my social schedule. I started to realize at this point that I was somewhat different than my classmates. I wasn't one to act out in class. Our conversations were sometimes difficult because, even though the kids were older than me by at least a year, their interests didn't align with mine very much. But that was okay, because I learned to keep topics they enjoyed, like sports. I finished the first grade with flying colors. My parents didn't push their school to give me more work, because I was just learning about school itself. I remember the conversation my parents and I had on the ride home on the last day of school that year. Before this day, we had many wonderful conversations where they asked me to give my input to my educational journey. On this particular day, they asked me to summarize how the first grade was. I said, I did pretty well, but I was glad I was on break. My mom then asked me, did you give it your best effort in the first grade? Being honest, I said, no. She didn't ask me why not. I remember thinking for a moment and saying to her, 
because they accepted it. There was silence in the car. My parents looked at each other as we drove up the interstate. I had managed, without realizing, to figure out the men that were part of me for my teachers at school, and that was what I was doing. My interests were elsewhere. Everything at school was just easy, review, and busy work. I didn't get in trouble for being honest. My parents may know that next year would be different. Three days finished of the first grade, and continued to expand my per a Lego and technology interests. Proof that year was great. I got the Lego Mindstorm EV3. This Lego set combined my love of learning with the technology to learn programming. I learned so much from trial and error and exploration. I learned about all the sensors and chewed through all online curriculum. I was learning gear ratios, the grease rotation, and sensor technology all on my own. That summer, I got my first big break. I traveled out of state to attend a robotics camp at a major university. I was so excited. My parents had found some who knew about Mensa and was willing to give an age variance of several years to attend. I was just six at the time. I went in on the first day thinking, this is going to be great. I have my own computer program, the Lego EV3, and I list in my head of all the questions and things I wanted to accomplish at the week-long camp. Well, the first day went, well, we started with some basic programming and building of the robots using Legos. My parents had reminded me that I need to bring my A-game if it wanted to show what you know. This is a lesson that I've gotten accustomed to doing. Being young and gifted, one has someone to show what you know or to get teachers to respect your intelligence. The second day, after completing the entire week's lesson, it became clear to me they wasn't going to get in the advanced learning that I was wanting at the camp. I showed what I know approach had landed me the role of teacher's assistant. Not the idea I had in mind when I walked in that day. But I kept my cold because the next day was well, build your own Lego robot and program it to do whatever you wanted using the skills I learned at camp, or prior knowledge in my case. I went back to the hotel at night and I had a plan of attack for my robot bill and the program I wanted to accomplish. I spent the third day I spent the third day being told that I was wrong and what I wanted to do with a particular sensor on my robot. Couldn't be done. I got in the car that evening and I lost it. I was crying and mad at the same time. I never cried, and that was alarming to my parents. In between sobs and clenching of my fist, I asked them, How old do I have to be before people take me seriously? I realize I'm only six, but I know what I'm talking about. What is my age not going to hold me back? I turned the car around and went back on campus to talk to someone about my day. The assistant camp director came out to the car and asked what was wrong. He was aware of the situation in the classroom that day and the pushback I was giving the teacher. He said, Mike, as we explained earlier today, that sensor can't do what you're wanting it to do. I asked my mom if I could get on the internet. As I sat in the back seat, still strapped in my car seat, I proceeded to log onto the internet and go to a proper robotics site I like to follow and showed the assistant director research and experimentation proving what I was trying to accomplish with my robot. Right there, in black and white, was my vindication for my frustration and meltdown. The assistant director read a few lines of the research report, handed my phone back to me and said, I'm so very sorry. You are right and we are wrong. Several programmers stayed up tonight, that night to learn what I already knew so on that Thursday, they could try to help me achieve my camp goals. I didn't tell the story to brag or be boastful. I told the story because it is a milestone in my educational journey. At this camp, I didn't learn anything new about robotics and programming. I learned something even more valuable. I learned to have a voice, to speak up when I know I'm right and defend my knowledge, no matter who is telling me I'm wrong. My voice for my educational needs had been found. 
I went into the second grade with a totally different approach to learning at school. I was going to show what I know and not just do what's asked of me. This went on for several weeks, giving my new teachers the opportunity to learn me and assess my abilities. After several more weeks, I walked up to my teacher and said, I've watched you throughout the days here at school, and I realized you were busy having 19 other students in class with me. I know there was not much time to do other learning, but if I stand from recess, would you have time to teach me something new? I had to talk to my parents to see if it was okay to ask, but I decided I need to use my voice to advocate for more learning. I talked with my parents that evening and told them that I had done that, and they were proud of me for not only speaking up, but posing a possible solution to a lack of time, using recess. My parents had communicated with the school administration about my desire to learn more. A few days later, I was sitting out in the hallway floor with a clipboard, taking a test on material which I had never been exposed. Soon after, my parents had a conference with the school, at which time the administration said I didn't need to pass learning and showed the test to my parents with some wrong answers on it. This was their defense to not having my teacher teach me new material during recess. Something that myself and everyone in this room understands wasn't sinking in at school. Intelligence does not equal knowledge. They are not synonyms. I didn't say I could go out in the hallway floor with a clipboard and get a perfect score on a test covering topics I had never been exposed. What I was asking was for the opportunity to learn and gain the knowledge of those topics. I'll say it once again. Intelligence does not equal knowledge. This type of constant of understanding is another obstacle I have encountered many times. I was given several more assessments throughout the rest of the second grade, scoring above grade level each time. Nothing changed in the classroom. I was on my side of the fishing deer with perfect marks, but not gaining much knowledge. The seven hours at school seemed like a black hole that nothing ever came out of. I longed for summer break. I wanted to spend my time learning on my own. During the second grade, I began learning computer programming on my own. I checked books out of the library and watched online videos about programming. I loved it. Yes, by this point, I found the internet. My parents only screened the videos and allowed me on certain safe sites and tutorials. Okay, so, in my house, parental controls on a computer doesn't exactly mean what you think. Normally, that means the settings a parent puts on a child's device to limit their access to content on the internet. Well, in my house, parental control means my parents saying, Mike, you will not go on the internet without our approval or supervision. That's because they learn how to back go around them at a very early age. I still respect and follow this rule today. That summer, after second grade, I got into a computer program kept held at another major university. The regional director felt so bad about last year's robotics camp that they got me a rather large aid variant to attend this camp. I walked onto the courtyard of the buildings looked, and looked up and said, This is my time. I got checked at the camp, my parents talked to the director, and we met my instructor for the week. My instructor jokingly laughed and thought my age on his roster was a typo, and I was 17, not 7, as was listed. I remember my mom telling him, just don't underestimate him. He's only 7 and self-taught, but this is his passion. That evening, at pickup time for camp, my instructor said to my parents that they were right. Mike was amazing today. Later, when we were riding to the hotel, <laughs> later, I told my parents that camp today was great, and they only corrected my instructor twice. <laughs> we all laughed at my choice of time to use my voice, and then they told me not to do that anymore. The next day, oh, okay, I'll, I'll let's get our laughs out. Everybody good? Okay. The next day, I finished up all the core material for the week. 
I was nervous again that in my experience a repeat of last summer. A, an instructor and the director contacted my parents and asked if they could push forward into uncharted waters. My parents were extremely pleased and only put one restriction on them. The new material had to be age appropriate for me at seven. I found an instructor who was looking at my abilities and not my age. Their next three days were the best. There were no limits about what I can learn. I was only limited by the time I had left the camp. I texted my parents that day and said, Tango is between 5 and 6, so if we don't come until 5.45, I can program longer each day. That's exactly what I did. I programmed on breaks, during lunch, and late into the evening. I was learning. The pace and lack of restrictions was exhilarating. I left that week feeling I gained more knowledge than I had in the two years of school. Learning can be fun, but the right teacher and flexibility. We hear a lot about the difference between a profoundly gifted kid's calendar age and in their intellectual age. This picture illustrates me that topic perfectly about me. There I am, seven years old, traveling to summer camp. I think we're somewhere in Pennsylvania at that point. I'm strapped in my car seat holding on to one of my favorite stuffed animals, to my cool and colorful PJs, all of our reading and college textbook on object-oriented programming in Python. <laughs> you see here, I'm still a kid. I like doing kid things, but alone with a higher level of learning. I can build a robotic behavior to be sold around the world one minute, and the next, while a couple of miles in my knee when playing with Hot Wheels. Learning is fun, but being a kid is equally fun. At this point, my parents are spending an enormous amount of their time looking for more opportunities for me to learn at the level and pace I needed. They toured more schools, both public and private. My mom ran about this school in Reno, Nevada. That was for profound gift to kids. It sounded like a place that understood the struggles we were facing with my education. We all looked over and decided it was something worth pursuing. I would have to take another intelligence test as mine was a few years old at that point. I again scored high enough and we began the application process. I began a Davis Young Scholar in October of 2016, just as third grade was starting. I knew this distinction give me even more credibility to show my school that I was capable of doing so much more. I struggled with my show what I know model in third grade. The math that year was learning multiplication facts. And I already knew mine. I decided earlier on in my programming that I need to know them. So I learned them all the way up through 15. And math, I had to do as many as I could in five minutes. The goal is to get 90 or more prep to move on. I repeatedly did an excess of 160 with no errors. The same test, however, was put in front of me over and over again. All I did at school was wish the day away so I could get home and learn. I didn't act out. I just discussed with my parents that it was time for something to change. The Davidson Institute for Talent Development has assigned me a family advisor was willing to talk to my school and give me guidance to the teacher about teaching profound to the students. My parents went in again offering this option, but the school wanted nothing to do with outside help or guidance. I was going nowhere. I felt like I was trying to run toward knowledge, but they had a hold of my shirt collar holding me back. We asked about skip me ahead of grade, as my testing was already several grades higher, but were denied due to my age. I finished the third grade having discussed with my parents that I would not be returning to this school next year. And the last day at this school was the worst day. The last day, the, the same administration that had held me back had presented me with a top math award. I had shown what I know and not only won the school, top state and regional continental math league awards. Okay, so now we can tell who won that boot battle in the beginning. <laughs> I walked out the door that day and never looked back. Something great happened at Christmas that year on third grade.
my mom and dad had taken me to the National Gift Card Conference earlier in the fall. One of the vendors had a now robot. I spent a good bit of time in this booth discussing the capabilities of the robot. Leaving that convention, we knew this is what I needed to continue to expand my robotic knowledge. My parents searched all around our area for anyone who had a now robot, including schools and universities, with no success. My parents made the decision to acquire the now robot you see with me today. His name is Infinite. I named him that because I know the things we can learn and do together would be truly infinite. I'm going to let him share our dream with you in just a few minutes. So Infinite and I love to follow the advancements in today's technology and news. If for those fellow SpaceX fans out there, you will appreciate this next slide. My little homage to Starman and Elon Musk. But remember, don't panic! I continued to learn programming and robotics in my free time. I went back to camp at the same university, but this time learning about programming, cybersecurity, uh, excuse me, cryptology, cybersecurity, and I even built a computer. I was once again allowed to go beyond the curriculum and keep on learning. I want to stop here for a moment and cover a topic that drives me crazy. We have all heard to get kids to unplug from computers and Step away from the screen. This idea or notion that kids are damning themselves in front of a computer isn't exactly true. To be fair, the unplugged campaign used to come with a disclaimer. I do agree that limiting the amount of video game time might be a good idea, but to put that over all electronics just doesn't work. This isn't fair. Electronics have been my outlet, my window to the world of learning. You have to go where the information is located. Computers are a great way to access it. I feel that as long as a child is learning from a device or game, let them play it. Knowledge comes in many forms these days, and to say that all screen time is bad just doesn't work for me. I wouldn't be speaking to you all today if I hadn't stayed plugged in to my own learning. Next, school is about to start for the first time in several years. I was excited to be going. I was going to a new school and skipping a grade at the same time. My parents had located a group of devoted and loving educators who didn't look at my age. They merely wanted me to learn. The director of the school looked at each student as an individual with different goals and needs. I advanced up to the fifth grade with a highly individualized schedule. I attended school three days a week and was allowed to take a high school computer course online. I was doing so much, it wasn't wasting my time doing busy work. I was excelling toward my potential. It was allowed to use my spare time to advance my other interests. As the year progressed, I continued to excel. My model was working. So I what you know and speaking up for what I did was being hurt by a wonderful team of teachers. It takes a team to educate a a student, and I have found my team. Each one realized that I had an amazing gift and wanted to do their part in seeing me reach my fullest potential. Sure, it took some extra time and creativity to get me where I needed to go throughout the year, but they always figured it out. The faculty and staff in the new school are facilitators of learning more, and not just teachers of a box of knowledge. They were willing to learn with me and provide me access to resources which has allowed my learning to flourish. I want to give a shout out to Jeff LaCroix at CFA Academy because he has helped me throughout the whole entire year. I can stand here today and say with confidence that there is nowhere that I could be attending school that will allow me to go and learn what my current school does. This fall, I am proud to be returning back to CFA Academy in Concord, North Carolina as a ninth grader. I was given three grades, and I'm looking forward to high school. I will be continuing my Davidson Institute online classes as well. My journey is far from over, but the future is free of black holes, and the windows of knowledge are wide open to me. And I also, tomorrow, I leave Indianapolis, and I head back to camp for more work on 
artificial intelligence, and machine learning at MIT. Flanking back as I was preparing this speech, there have been many hard and frustrating days along the way. The key for me was to never stop fighting my way over the obstacles and never settle for anything less than what I deserve in education. Why is my journey important? And why highlight some of the struggles? The main reason is to open a dialogue about gifted education in this country for the profoundly gifted. The journeys of myself and anyone like me should not have to be a struggle. We need to look at our leaders in Washington and tell them it's time to make this country an intellectual superpower. With the help and support of my parents and many others, I found my way as the outdated, unequipped educational system. But many students like me are stuck behind obstacles with no way out, their potential being lost to the system. As Americans, we have an obligation to teach each student their full potential. We are laying the best and brightest in the country down. Teachers can't teach with no understand. How can a teacher be expected to know how to teach a profoundly gifted student if they themselves are not least highly gifted? You won't want me doing brain surgery if my training was in cardiology. The same logic can be applied to teach profoundly gifted students. Profoundly gifted students are not very common. Let's look at the population. How do we get our country leaders to justify funds for such a small percentage of the population? Let's begin by reminding them that we are the next great problem solvers of the world. I want you to think about this for a moment. What if you, the students, with the insight and potential to cure cancer, are being blocked right now in schools that do not understand them and they are about to give up? Here the news talks about going to Mars. The idea of people living in colonies on Mars. How long ago did we land on the moon? A long time ago. And I feel that with the proper funding and education of teachers for found gifted the students, he would have been on Mars decades ago. <laughs> Alternative fields and advanced in medicine will be way ahead of their current progress, just to name a few. Profound gifted students are America's most valuable resource. We owe it to ourselves to help each one reach their fullest potential. We need to make this country smart again with educational programs and funding for students like me. I want to achieve my goals. Can we say that for all the others out there like me? Moving back in my journey, I want to turn the program over to Infinite. The Bachman program has been my greatest source of learning and inspiration. Everything you are about to see had to be designed and programmed by me. From movements to speech, anything, me. I use Python coding for this program. I hope you enjoy it. Now, can you guys over here see Infinite? Okay. I don't trust this table nor this stage. <laughs> I accidentally hit the flip button on him. So, oops. <laughs> My fault. This is what a normal program looks like. Yes, it's messy. That's, that's what it looks like. This folks. Sure. 
but just to name a few. I will now demonstrate my incredible balance for you. Still on Tracer's table.
Those of you who didn't know that were about the math was over.
problem with this gummy. than they need to be. My first app will tackle one of these complex issues. You can follow my development progress on my website, nexterainnovations.com. I have a final request of each of you this morning. So no, don't pack up yet. When you leave the animal gather and return to your part of the country, remember this. Each profound gift of the student deserves the opportunity to learn at their pace and level free of obstacles and roadblocks. Help a gift of student find who's for a voice and speak up for what they need. Help them plug into the information and refute the blanket stereotype of unplugging. Talk to anybody and everybody who will listen and don't settle for anything less than what he or she deserves in an education. Contact your local, state, and U.S. representatives and tell them it's time to make programs and funding available the most vital resource this country has. Kids like me. There's never a time this day to start dialogue about fixing gifted education in America. My hope is that when we meet next year at the AM Gathering, we can all look back and say, a new era in gifted education starts today, and we are a part of it. Thank you, and thank you for your time. <laughs> 